Thanks for tuning in to the IGM podcast. We're so glad you've decided to explore God's word with us. We look forward to connecting with you in email at info at or online at our website, www.integritygm.com. We hope this podcast encourages you to grow in the knowledge of God through his word. Be blessed. Greetings to everyone today in the name of Yeshua, the Messiah, in the name of Jesus the Christ. Today I'm in the studio with my son, and we're going to look at the letter that Paul wrote to the Corinthians. And we're going to look at this letter going chapter by chapter as far as that we can go together, starting from the historical background, establishing what Paul is trying to say through the flow of thought, hitting the essence of every single chapter, and really bringing forth the principles that Paul is writing back to the church at Corinth. When I say church, I'm talking about the community of faith, the believers at Corinth. This is the fifth letter that we're going to be studying, and we're looking at the New Covenant Scriptures chronologically. And when I say chronologically, I'm talking about which letters were written first going all the way to the end. There are many different ways that you can study the New Covenant chronologically, from a historical standpoint, from the development of the events, but we're looking at the unfolding of the New Covenant Scriptures and how it's unfolding chronologically. And what we mean by that, which letter was written first, which one was written second. It gives you a glimpse into the life of the early believers and what is happening within the church, the body of Christ, the issues that are developing. So the first one that was written was Jacob, or we sometimes say James. You see that this is written solely to Jewish believers. Then you go to Galatians. And you look at Galatians, these are Gentile believers that are coming to faith through Jewish believers bringing the gospel to them. First and second Thessalonians, it was a mixture. You had Jews that had come to faith, you had Gentiles, you had prominent women, you had a mixture back in Thessalonica, a lot of persecution going on, and Paul is writing back from Corinth to the believers at Thessalonica. Now we have Paul writing back from Ephesus to the believers in the city of Corinth. I'm going to ask my son Cole if you would read Acts chapter 18, verses 1 through 11. Now, why are we reading these verses? It's because this is how the church was established in the city of Corinth, how Paul brought the gospel to the city. He is the founder. He is the apostle. And we want to read about the background of this community of faith that developed. So Cole, if you don't mind reading these verses. Yes, and thanks for having me in this studio. I'm excited to be here. And I'll be reading from the New American Standard Bible, starting in verse 1 of chapter 18 of the book of Acts. After these things, he left Athens and went to Corinth. And he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, having recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome, he came to them, and because he was one of the same trade, he stayed with them, and they were working, for by trade they were tent makers. And he was reasoning in the synagogue every Sabbath and trying to persuade Jews and Greeks. But when Silas and Timothy came down from Macedonia, Paul began devoting himself completely to the word, solemnly testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Christ. But when they resisted and blasphemed, he shook out his garments and said to them, Your blood be on your own heads. I am clean. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. Then he left there and went to the house of a man named Titus Justus, a worshiper of God, whose house was next to the synagogue. Crispus, the leader of the synagogue, believed in the Lord with all his household, And many of the Corinthians, when they heard, were believing and being baptized. And the Lord said to Paul in the night by a vision, Do not be afraid any longer, but go on speaking and do not be silent, for I am with you, and no man will attack you in order to harm you, for I have many people in this city. And he settled there a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. It's incredible, and thank you, Cole, for reading When you look at the book of Acts, and the best title for the book of Acts is not the Acts of the Apostles, which sometimes we give that title, but it's the Acts or the Works of the Holy Spirit. 
you see the Holy Spirit using the apostles and others to establish this gospel from Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. When you start reading about how these congregations, these communities of faith develop, it's incredible, especially coming from a Western Christian society. When starting a new church, you're starting sometimes with 500 people, other believers coming, and you have so much support and background and finances and these kind of things. Most of the time when you're dealing, say, in America about a new church, you're dealing with church transfer from one community of faith to another community of faith. But think, these Jewish apostles are showing up in a city preaching a gospel to the Jews first. They always go to the synagogue. But in Corinth, it's rejected. But the leader of the synagogue is receiving the gospel. They turn to the Gentiles. In mass numbers, do they start coming to faith? Now think about this, Cole, the background of these new believers. They're not from a Jewish background. They may not even know much about the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, whose name is Israel. They may not even know much about the background of the prophecies in the Hebrew Scriptures, what we call the Old Covenant. They're coming to faith by a work of God's Spirit. These are first-generation believers that do not have any background in the Bible, most of them. Now, some of them have gone to the synagogues. They were described as God-fearing Gentiles, sometimes go to the synagogues, listen to the preaching, having respect for the law of Moses and for the Jewish people. But a large amount of them are coming to faith that do not have any background in God's Word. And they're believing, and they're asking God for the forgiveness of sins in Jesus' name. And it is a work of God's Holy Spirit. Now, I've read sociologists and people, historians, that try to explain this from an economic standpoint, from a social standpoint. Why are so many people in the Roman Empire coming to faith? But I get back to the understanding from a biblical perspective is they're coming to faith through a work of God's Holy Spirit. There's not any other answer to this. Why would Gentiles start believing in the Jewish Messiah, the forgiveness of sins, when this concept of sin is not even strong in their cultures? It's a pantheistic culture. They're coming to faith and putting their faith in Jesus, the Christ, and Yeshua, the Messiah, and saying he is the only way to God, and we commit our lives to him, that he is the way, the truth, and the life. So there's not any, from my perspective, any other way to understand this except by a work of God's Holy Spirit. Do you have any thoughts concerning that? Absolutely. It's quite incredible to think the challenge that is now before Paul and the other apostles of you've now established a new community of faith solely built on new believers, like you mentioned, from a completely different worldview and cultural and ethical and moral standard than the Jewish people. So now you have this group of new believers that Paul has the the challenge and the responsibility to disciple them and to create a functioning body of believers that can be a witness and a holy people to the city of Corinth. What a challenge he has before him. And in this letter, he's going to describe them as infants, mm. babes, in the sense of spiritually. Right. And so we're going to deal with that as we get into the text as well. From these 11 verses, we're seeing that he did have help from Aquila, and he had his wife Priscilla that had been kicked out of Rome by Claudius. And we know that that happened around the year A.D. 49, as we look back on the history. So we're looking at a time frame after A.D. 49, or shortly after that. We don't know when they arrived in Corinth, but we look back at Acts chapter 15 as taking place in A.D. 49, A.D. 50. Say if they were kicked out at that time frame, they ended up in Corinth sometime after that. Now Paul comes to Corinth and he found a Jew named Aquila. And so Claudius had kicked out the Jews in A.D. 49, and there is some debate on this of who Christos is. But one of the reasons why they were kicked out of Rome by Claudius 
was all of this controversy and debate over one named Christos. And we believe from a historical standpoint that could only be about the Christ in the Greek language. Controversies among the Jews is Yeshua. Yeshua is his Hebrew Aramaic pronunciation of his name, which is Joshua in English. But there's a transliteration that has taken from language to language that today we say Jesus. And But there was this controversy going on among the Jewish people of Christos and Claudius, who blamed the Jews for many different things, kicked them out of the city. And one of the reasons was this reason. So we know from this context that Aquila and his wife Priscilla are believers. Now, later on, we're going to see in the book of Acts and in different places, they are described as Priscilla and Aquila. And in almost every place that we see this, which is probably indicating from a literary cultural standpoint that Priscilla is more of the spokesperson. However, she's always described along with her husband. So many people see this as that, yes, Priscilla is more being the spokesperson, but she's doing it under the authority of her husband, Aquila. Also, their reasoning with the Jews every Shabbat, every Sabbath at the synagogue, and trying to persuade Jews and Greeks. Now, this term Jews and Greeks, of course, we understand Jews, but what about the Greeks? These Greeks could be Hellenistic Jews, or they could be God-fearing Gentiles that have come into the synagogues to listen to the preaching of God's Word or the teaching of God's Word. We don't know for sure there, but they're doing this every Sabbath, And you're seeing probably an influence within the synagogue that's coming to a point of confrontation that you're going to see later that they're going to be kicked out of the synagogue. This happens many times. Yes, I'm just thinking of how much of a blessing it would be to Paul to come into the city of Corinth and already have people like Aquila and Priscilla in the city, people who are already believers in Christ, establishing a faithful presence in that city It must have been such a benefit to his long-term ongoing ministry there to not only having new converts into the church, but already having some established faithful workers to partner with him. Yes, and not only are they believers, they're mature believers. Right. And think about how the church in Rome probably got started. It probably got started, as you go back to Acts chapter 1, In Acts chapter 2, there were Jews that came from all over the world, and we're talking about the Roman world, and one of those cities was Rome. They came in from Passover to Pentecost, from Pesach to Shavuot, are coming into the city. Remember, Peter preaches and 3,000 Jews come to faith on the day of Pentecost and take water baptism. Some of them could have come to Rome. Then they're going to be going back, some of them back to their cities. We don't know for sure, but Aquila and Priscilla could have been believers for a long time. They could have been one of the ones proclaiming that Jesus is the Messiah in the city of Rome. But Claudius kicked all the Jews out, and so they end up in Corinth. And I agree with you how incredible it is not only to find believers, but to find strong believers, because we're going to find out that they explain the way of the Lord to Apollos more clearly from the Scriptures. Because Apollos only knew about John's baptism. So not only are they believers, they are well-discipled believers. We see that in the context of the book of Acts. And to have them alongside with Paul is a tremendous blessing. Right. And I think it's also interesting to see how earlier in the book of Acts, Paul has been commissioned and sees his specific mission to be an apostle and a light to the Gentiles But he still seems to have this conviction to first offer the good news to the house of Israel, to his uh, Jewish brothers and sisters. I think it's interesting how even with the understanding that God has specifically equipped and commissioned him to spread the gospel in the Gentile world, that he still has that conviction to first offer the good news to his fellow Jewish brothers and sisters. Yes, and not only did he have that conviction... Jesus, the Messiah, had that conviction. And salvation comes from the Jews, and Jews had the first opportunity. 
and in his calling, I'm going to go to Acts chapter 9, because his calling shares in the order in which God speaks his calling to him, it really says something about where he's going to be used the most. But it did not change the conviction first to the Jew and also to the Greek. In Acts chapter 9, verses 15 and 16, But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine, talking about Shaul, Paul, to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the sons of Israel. So the list of the order is very important within that culture that he would bear his name before the Gentiles and kings and the sons of Israel. So it's, to me, showing where uh, where he's going to be used by God the most. The sons of Israel comes last on that list. From a scriptural conviction, he always went to the synagogue first. But where did God use him the most? It was among the Gentiles. And then the last verse that we never read. For I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. And suffering is a part of Pauline theology. It's a scriptural understanding that Jesus brought to his disciples. And Saul, Shaul, or Saul, is going to understand this principle very clearly. If you're connected to Jesus, and if the world hated me, they will hate you. And he's going to understand this aspect of suffering for the name of Christ. How do you think that idea of Paul's suffering ties into what we, we read earlier in Acts chapter 18? In verse 9, it says, The Lord said to Paul, Do not be afraid any longer, but go on speaking and do not be silent. What, what is the context for that in these verses? Well, if you can hold on for just a moment, we'll get to that because it's a good question. It's one of the things I wanted to cover in this chapter, but we'll get to it here in a second, because suffering is a part of Paul's ministry, but in Corinth, God gave him protection. Again, let's look at Acts chapter 18. So we've dealt with Aquila, Priscilla, Claudius, the date of AD 49, that the Jews were kicked out of Rome. And also, I want to look at, we looked at that he's reasoning in the synagogue every Sabbath. He's preaching the gospel to the Jews first. He always had that conviction. Jesus had that conviction as well. And it's very clear that the salvation comes from the Jews. Then when we look at verse 5, But when Silas and Timothy came from Macedonia... The church at Philippi was the first community of faith that was established in Europe, which is Macedonia. They could have come from Philippi. And if we read later the letter that Paul writes to the Philippians, they had helped Paul out several times with an offering in order to help him in ministry. So it's an assumption, but they could have come with an offering coming to Corinth, which freed Paul up to stop working with his hands and devoting himself completely to the ministry of God's Word. Now, Paul was not afraid to work with his own hands. Most of his ministry, he was a tent maker. What does that mean? He made tents. He supported himself. There were times when he could have asked the congregations to support him financially, but he did not do that to set a good example for them that he's not doing this for money, that there wasn't anyone that can make an accusation against him. Well, he's doing this for money. And we also always have to be careful with the issue of money. We are ministers of the gospel, not from a financial standpoint, not that a church has to support me, not that people have to give. We do this because of God's calling upon our lives. This is very evident within Paul's ministry. And he loved the gospel so much, he was willing to work with his hands. So he wasn't on television asking for money, asking people to send their seed faith offerings and to give to him and God will give back to you. That was not an emphasis of his life and ministry of what we see today. He was even willing to work a factory job. Let's call it in that context. Work with his hands to support himself to be able to preach the gospel from a pure heart, pure motives. Now, anyone can always question your motives, but he's always doing everything to try to lessen the attack 
against the gospel. And we see that throughout his whole ministry. There could have been, from verse 5, an offering that came from Philippi. We do not know for sure. But when they came, Silas and Timothy, Paul began devoting himself completely to the word, solemnly testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Messiah, the Christ. But they resisted and blasphemed. He shook out his garments and said to them, Your blood be on your own head. I am clean. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. So he spent quality amount of time first ministering the gospel to the Jews when they did not receive as a community. Now, there would have been some that received. And we're going to see Crispus, the leader of the synagogue, received and believed. When they didn't receive, this is an act of saying, Now... It's on your hands. I'm free from this. I've given you the gospel. I've given you the truth. You've rejected it. Now I'm turning to the Gentiles. This is consistent within Paul's ministry of how he did things. This is also consistent when Jesus sent out the 70 or the 72 disciples. If they don't receive you, shake the dust from your sandals from that city or from that place. This is a scriptural approach that is saying, now it's on your hands. We came here to bring you the truth. You've rejected the truth. Now we're moving on. Any thoughts concerning that? I guess just a question. Would you view that as maybe a universal principle that when you are entering into a community to share the gospel, if the community doesn't receive the gospel, then you have the right or the imperative scripturally to move on to the next community? Or are there certain cases where we're called to just continue to be a faithful witness even as a community is, say, rejecting the gospel or not even open to the gospel yet? It's a great question that I don't mind saying I do not know. I think there's two truths that can exist at the same time, seem to be opposite, and both be truth, and both can be a biblical perspective. You see prophets that prophesy continually to the nation of Israel. Year after year, Isaiah's ministry was around 60 years. Jeremiah's 40 years. They didn't receive Jeremiah's ministry, but he was consistent to continue that ministry. And then you see other times where they say, I'm no longer responsible. I've given you the truth. I'm moving on. How do I look at this? I believe that Paul was right to do this. He felt that he had spent quality time A quantity of time he had brought the gospel to the synagogue in Corinth, and now it was time to move on. There are also guys that minister for decades and never see one person come to faith. But they continue to do that because God's called them there, and they spend 13 years, like some apostles or missionaries that have apostolic ministry, in a nation before they see the first person come to faith. And we've seen this in the history of individuals that laid down their lives to try to bring a foundation but didn't see many people come to faith. And now today there's millions in that people group, that nation, that part of the world that have come to faith in Jesus Christ. So to not answer your question, I think I hopefully brought some answer. So I'm ministering to a community. They're not receiving. I feel like God is saying you need to move on. I can say to them, you're responsible. I brought the truth to you. And then there can be another person that comes and says, I'm going to be here on the long term. Even if you kill me, God's called me to be here. I'm staying here to lay the foundation. Absolutely. And I think maybe the important part there is the individual being sensitive to the leading of the Holy Spirit. Is the Holy Spirit calling them to stay there and to be a faithful witness? Or is the Holy Spirit asking them to move on? Yes, I believe that. The leading of the Holy Spirit in everything that we do. Let's continue to go down through this context. We're getting close to 30 minutes, so in this session, we're probably only going to get through the the background. Crispus, the leader of the synagogue, believed in all of his household. Some people believe that when you come to faith, that you automatically, your whole household comes to faith. And I, I name that and I claim that, and that means all of my family will be saved. You have to understand this in the historical context. A father is the head of their home in that culture. If he believes and he makes a decision that he and his whole household are going to be believers, he is the head, he is the voice, 
He is the one making the decision for his whole household. That is true. That is something culturally that can be done in many cultures even today. However, we're living in a Western culture that's based upon rugged individualism. And so, therefore, it doesn't always apply to us today that I can say automatically, all of my household is saved. I'm claiming that. Well, I'm going to pray for that. I'm going to believe that. But today, in our culture, with the, even within the community of faith, we see time and time again, a father is not the head of his home. He's not even the head of his marriage many times because we've drifted so far away from the scriptural understanding of marriage and family. When Paul says to the jailer at Philippi, you and all of your household will be saved, if he comes to faith, Paul understands all of his household will come to faith. It's something that will be genuine also because if the father believes I'm the son, I believe, and I embrace who my father is. And if he says it's truth, we're all going to stand together. That doesn't necessarily mean that that is a scriptural promise for everybody, every place that I can say, because I believe, then that my whole family will get saved. And remember, it's only said to the, the men who are the head of their households. Cole, we'll see in certain places in Asia, when the head of the village comes to faith, the whole village comes. Just by the decision of that one individual, the whole village embraces the gospel. Now, does that mean from the heart? We don't know. But they are saying, he is our head. He is our leader. He is believing that Jesus is the Messiah. We all believe and we all put our faith and trust in him. Right. And I think that's such an important principle as we engage in global mission as we enter into different communities that we understand what is the worldview of this community. If it is a very communal society and a very strong family unit, then perhaps witnessing or sharing the gospel to one member of the family who isn't the head of the family, that could be incredibly disruptive. And so I think it's just a very important thing to remember. And we see Paul here, he doesn't push against the grain of the society, he recognizes that the father is the head of the household, and so that's who he shares the gospel with. And I think that's a, a really important principle. Yes, and let me uh, throw this out to go with that. You see Paul and Philippi ministering to the women down by the river in public view, not in secret, but in public. So it's not that we only minister in these societies to the head, but when we look at this in Crispus, when he made a decision, it was not just for him. You cannot, as a head of your home, be a believer in Jesus as the Messiah and your wife say, I'm not a believer. She will embrace the husband. The children will embrace the faith of the parents. They are one. They are a family. It's a different dynamic than what we promote here. So I'm not saying that we only share the gospel to certain people in certain cultures. We share the gospel with everybody. But in certain cultures, when the head makes a decision, it's not just a decision for him. It's a decision for his wife, for his children, sometimes for the whole village. And they all come and say, now we're Christians because our leader has become, we embrace what he embraces. It's so foreign for us in the Western culture. But I did want to point that out, and now I'm going to get to what you brought out earlier about the suffering understanding of Paul. Paul was told in his calling that God said, I will show him how much he will suffer. All through Paul's ministry, he is attacked physically, mentally, spiritually. He's attacked from within inside the congregations, from false teachers, and he is attacked from the outside. You're going to read this as we go through the second letter. Because what he's writing back to the Corinthians, there are leaders that have developed false teachers that are standing in opposition to what he's writing. Now, he established this church. He gave it its foundation, and the foundation was on Christ. But people come in and want to take advantage of that and build a following inside of that, and they want the foundation to be about themselves. And they want people to center themselves on them and not on Christ and not the foundation in which Paul laid. He's going to be attacked from within the Corinthian church by false teachers. 
He's getting an attack from outside. In fact, by this time, by the time he writes the second letter, I think he has received the lashes five times. He has been beaten five times because of his faith in Jesus Christ. He was beaten before Corinth. He was attacked and beaten after Corinth. But while he is in Corinth, God gives him a protection that no man's going to harm him within this city. And God comes to him by a vision and says, do not be afraid any longer, which means that there was timidity or fear that had developed within Corinth. Sometimes we get beaten up so much and we go through so many trials physically, emotionally, spiritually, you know, the spiritual attack that comes is quite strong, that you get to the point that you want to say, I just give up, and I don't want to go through these struggles any longer. So there was fear that had developed within his life where God says to him, do not be afraid any longer, but go on speaking and do not be silent, for I am with you, and no man will attack you in order to harm you, for I have many people in this city. So in the city of Corinth, there was not suffering that was going on within Paul's life concerning the ministry. He wasn't getting beaten up. He wasn't being put in prison. He had freedom for a year and a half to preach the gospel, not to be silent, to be built up, I believe, to be built up spiritually himself, physically, He says, don't be silent. Keep on speaking. God is saying to him. And there was a promise for Paul in the city of Corinth. I want to stress that because it wasn't before Corinth and it wasn't after Corinth. And those that are in the uh, Word of Faith movement, they will come and say, well, there's a promise from God that no one will attack me because God promised it to Paul. He promises it to me. No, original intent. He promised this to Paul in the city of Corinth. He's going to have his head cut off about 12 years later from this letter and when it's written. So it's not a promise that's going to stay with him all of his life. It's a promise that God made to him in the city of Corinth. For a year and a half, no man touched him in this city. Praise God for that. God is building Paul back up in this city where he's not so much suffering, but it's given freedom to preach and teach God's word in the city of Corinth. Clearly, God had a specific plan and a purpose for the city of Corinth to do a great work there. Do you mind sharing a little bit of the background of the city of Corinth, the social dynamics and just economics, anything that you can share about the city of Corinth? Yes, thank you, Paul. Um, (laughs) Thank you, Cole, because we're at 35 minutes. We've got to wrap up the background. These are so important. The author is Paul. His Hebrew name is Shaul. His name in the Greek-speaking world and among the Roman world was Paul. There's not any debate that this is a letter from Paul. There's always liberal scholars that come about and they try to say because there's a difference in vocabulary or that this is not Paul writing. But from good scholarship, from the historical background, this is the Apostle Paul writing back to the church at Corinth. The date is A.D. 55. He's writing from Ephesus. He's in Ephesus from 53 to 55 AD. He is writing back to them about issues within the congregation. And some of these issues are probably coming from the culture in which they're getting saved. So let's talk about the city for a moment. The city is about 650,000 people. It's a Roman city that had been destroyed and rebuilt, but it's a Hellenistic city. It's a pagan city. 650,000 people, 400,000 of them are slaves, 250,000 of them are free. So you have an issue that the majority of the city are slaves. The, The word slave comes from Slav, from the Slavic people. The Romans loved to use the Slavic people as slaves. And today we use the term of someone that's not free as a Slav or a slave. So they built their empire sometimes, their great cities, their roads, their military by slave labor. It's a very unfortunate thing. But among the slaves, many of them are coming to faith in Jesus the Christ. Praise God for that. 
in the city of Corinth, a Hellenistic city, they had lots of philosophers. Philosophers would come and people would actually buy tickets to go listen to their new philosophy, their teaching, and they would align themselves with philosophers. This might give some of the background of why there were so many factions among teachers, even when teachers did not create this faction. Paul didn't create this faction, but there are some that are saying, we're of Paul, some of Cephas, some of Apollos. We're seeing this develop within the Corinthian church because it's a city of philosophers. Okay, we align ourselves with this individual. Immorality, hedonism. Immorality and hedonism will always go together. Self-centeredness, immorality. There is one temple in the city, a temple to Aphrodite, that we believe existed at that time. This temple had over a thousand or a thousand prostitutes that worked within the temple. All the old pagan temples had an element of immorality that was part of their worship. And so you look at the immorality of the city through what was happening religiously. And the the religious culture had influence of every aspect of society. There was a term that was used to be Corinthianized, that when a person went into the city and participated in the immorality of the city, they were described as Corinthianized. There's a museum that describes the immorality of the city that I will not go into all the specifics. However, just picture a city that has been saturated by immorality and it comes through the religious structure of the city into every aspect of the society. Also, there was a lack of scriptural background. When we look at the majority of these believers are coming from a Gentile background, yes, Paul was there for a year and a half, but when he writes back to them, he still describes them as infants, as babes, and have not grown up, had not matured, probably because others have come in and taken advantage of what Paul has done in establishing this community of faith. So you have philosophers, you have immorality, you have hedonism, try, you know, a culture that wants to fulfill self-gratification. You have slavery, you have a lack of scriptural background. You have all these elements of this city. It's a true pagan Roman Hellenistic city that exists. And now people are getting saved out of that background. And they're getting saved by the preaching of Jesus as the Messiah, the new covenant, and the forgiveness of sins. So hopefully that answers some of the background. And now we have read from Acts chapter 18, the establishment of this community of faith, understand a little bit of the background of the city, and now we're getting ready to jump into the text. Let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I just pray as we come through 1 Corinthians and we look at this letter, that the principles that you establish through your word will live within our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you'd like to learn more about IGM or have any questions about this podcast, feel free to reach out to us at info at integritygm.com and connect with us on Instagram at integrity underscore global and Facebook at Integrity Global Missions. If you like our podcast, please share it and leave a review. Thank you for listening. Have a blessed day.